Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first of EICC's Innovation Nation series for uh, 2016. This year has been designated uh, as a year in which Scotland's achievements in innovation, architecture and design will be showcased and celebrated. So it's fitting that tonight we'll hear about the fascinating theme of innovation, innovation in architecture. The Innovation Nation series is a concept created by the EICC sales and marketing team and launched early last year in celebration of innovation in Edinburgh and throughout Scotland. To date, it's attracted some of Scotland's leading innovators representing a broad range of topics, including healthcare, the arts, IT and space travel. Tonight, we're delighted to welcome two more highly qualified speakers for this evening's event. As well as being a celebration of innovation, the series also highlights the EICC's desire to engage with audiences from all backgrounds. By doing so, we want to inspire a new generation of ambassadors whilst demonstrating that EICC is much more than just a venue, but a hub of intellectual inspiration. We'll shortly be hearing from Karen Cunningham of the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland and Director of the 2016 Festival of Architecture. But now I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the evening from Heriot Watt University's School of the Built Environment. Please welcome Professor Sue Rofe. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a great honor and a pleasure to be talking to you this evening. I want to tell you something about our ideas of windows and clouds, innovation in architecture and engineering. We all of us occupy windows of history, passing glimpses of time in which our ideas are formed and developed, and in which, which also color the way we think about the world we live in. If you take, for instance, my grandfather, born in 1860, went into banking and insurance in Edinburgh, only to leave to go to be a missionary in the West Indies, possibly to make up for the atrocities of slavery. My father, a Harriet Watt engineer, um, who went out to Malaya, where I was born, to be part of the great revolution of Scottish engineering that built the empire myself in the age of space and travel, and my son now in new media and the internet and um, a whole different world of technologies. See how fast time travels, each of us occupying a different mindset and a very different view of the world around us. All those invisible windows that we catch including the thermal windows of history. And if you look at this chart, which shows the temperature differences from 1961 to 1990 average over time, you can see the dates here, how rapidly the world is warming. This again, another input into the world we design for in the future, a rapidly changing thermal world. <coughs> But we live in a world in which the challenges are enormous. Problem one, humanity, there's so many more of us. Problem two, industrialization, more, more of us more, using more and more energy and more and more um, energy as well. And that energy is the petroleum revolution comes with cars, the use of coal, nuclear, other renewables, that energy which is creating the um, Emissions of carbon dioxide, which is driving our changing climate. And how fast history of ch has changed. We were talking about it earlier. I was born into a world in which vernacular buildings were what we lived in. Ordinary buildings suited to the climates, whether it was Saudi Arabia or Malaya or the Arctic. Buildings designed for the climates they, they were built in until around about the sort of 1950s, really largely in America. And then later on in Europe and the UK, 1980, I think there were only three air-conditioned buildings in London. 
With all those increasing emissions with our energy use from our lifestyle and buildings, we've got this rapid change, which up until now has been fairly stable in the increased global temperatures related to the CO2 emissions. Um, gradually now, we're about one degree centigrade warmer than the long-term average. But the rate of change is speeding up, which is what's the great worry. So by 2045, we may be two degrees centigrade warmer. 2065, with business as usual as we're trajectory we're following now, we'll be around about three degrees centigrade warmer. And we can see outside how the climate around us is changing and changing the world we live in, even already. So what's been our response? I call this the one degree centigrade response insouciance in a way. We just don't get it. Um, and uh, I've been writing books for uh, 25 years and in the 1990s we, we really tried to do something about it with energy efficiency and so on. But as we were treading water, the rates of change around us were enormous. This is Dubai in 1990. It's Dubai 17 years later. And again, it's doubled and tripled in size and scale. Unfettered consumption, and yet we knew as early as the 1970s, the work of Club of Rome, that we had a problem of system capacity. It hasn't stopped us doing what we do. And in terms of architecture, year on year on year, buildings using more and more energy if you take the traditional old Victorian office block around us here, you'll probably have carbon emissions that are fairly well behaved. And if it's a good building, it's um, you know, sort of 10, 15 kilograms of CO2 a year. We get to the 1960s where you get the deep plan naturally ventilated offices. Um, and then we come into the typical air conditioned offices and the large-scale, prestigious, prestige, um, or the big glazed buildings, really. So what we do now is we look in our regulations at the performance of that type of building in relation to its typical performance. So we say this is a good practice building. And yet we are capable of designing buildings way down there, really good ones, all run on renewable energy. But every city you go to in the world, this happens to be Buenos Aires, you just look at the buildings, 1900s, 1950s, 1960s, uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, increasingly characterized by this trend, which is basically the building in increasingly shut off from the world around it. The building becomes nothing more than the box. The solution is a machine and nature is excluded. And that's the trouble. Energy is thrown away. <clears throat> if you go to America today, these are the lead platinum buildings. It costs you about $350,000 to get a lead platinum rating. And we are told that these are the best environmental buildings in the world. How do we deal with this? Well, internationally, uh, we're driven by legislation and directives. So in Europe, there are three or four different sorts of directives which um, influence what we do here in Scotland. You've got the Building Performance Directive, which specifies that you have to um, have certification of buildings. So you do now a model of a building, and the model says um, it will perform in this way, and it is given a certificate. Um, and that's a predicted certification, although we know that buildings actually perform very differently from the cert certificates they're given. We then, then got things like energy efficiency directives from Europe, um, where it's a framework of measures to promote energy efficiency and investment in renovation. That means more things like more insulation or better windows or the eco-design directive which is looking at eco-design requirements for products. So this will mean that you have to have a better air conditioner than you had five years ago, or a better heater and so on. So that's products driven too. And then we have things like the ozone depleting substances directive for <coughs> ozone, um, 
for um, halons, HCFCs and so on, with which we run our air conditioning systems. And you'll notice that a lot of this is simply about machines. That's how we're supposed to manage the way a building works. The solution is seen as a mechanical solution. Forget all that beautiful ambient energy, cold, heat, light, shade. Forget the behaviors of people. The solution is squarely in that central block there. <coughs> in the Scottish policy framework, so that's directives where you're, you're telling people what to do. Here we have policy frameworks. And in Scotland, we started on the road to cli uh, Scotland's climate change um, reactions or, or activities. And local authorities were the first to change, saying that they will improve their estates and operations. Um, we then have the very wonderful Climate Change Bill 2009, which set in place targets. We have to reduce our emissions by 42% by 2020, 50% by 2030, and 80% by 2050. Only it's jolly hard to do. And then we have action plans as people get increasingly panicked about the fact that we can't meet our targets. And right in the heart of those action plans, or the way, for instance, we develop new regulations, are the lobby groups, Construction Scotland, Homes for Scotland, Property Federation, Building Standards Division, sitting in a room deciding on what is acceptable for the building industry of Scotland to do. No one representing the ordinary citizens of Scotland there. So then we have the National Performance Framework, creating a more successful country. It doesn't say taking people out of fuel poverty or creating a better society. It's a more successful country and reducing emissions at the same time. So if you look at the building regulations, what do we find? We've got a um, table of contents, a handbook with insulation, ducts and vessels, lighting services, performance certificates and so on and that's if you look at the non-domestic regulations as well this is written largely by HEVAC engineers the, the the regulations are directed by panels who are like for some reason architects don't like going on um, building regulation panels but they really should do and what do you end up with you get this increasing division you know the the idea the sort of spurious idea that the architect is a building hairdresser. And um, the people who make buildings work are the engineers. How did it get to this? I mean, this is shocking. Um, why didn't we do more? Well, we've tried to do more. And as I said, I, I, let's look at the 90s. We became obsessed with energy efficiency. So you now have, for instance, I call this passive house thinking. Um, you have, they had this idea that if you designed a house that gains as much solar energy as it, in summer as it loses in winter, you could balance it up, etc., and you'd need no heating or cooling. Unfortunately, the heat gains are in summer and the heat losses are in winter. So that's a problem. So you have a lot of insulation around a lightweight building and large south-facing windows. And you do have problems like this increasing problem with the British building stock of overheating, serious overheating. But it was a simple rhetoric. It was insulation, good windows, airtight thermal built, bridging, heat recovery, important, and backed up with fairly simplistic Excel spreadsheets and a standard you have to pay money for. You know, it's a product again. Let's look at the noughties. Noughties were a bit more frisky. We discovered sustainability, yeah? And what did you do? You just got everything you could possibly think about, and you put it in a great big basket of apples and pears. So you're comparing water with waste with pollution, and you're giving it all points, and it's the same points regardless of where it is. And if you get, for instance, the big energy um, section here, you can have... You only need two out of the three of these arrows, so you can put a 50-pound bicycle store in a, and a five-pound energy-efficient external light bulb in, and you can reduce the, you, you can eliminate the need for um, 
a um, reduced heat fabric envelope. So forget about the better building. You've got the light bulb in. Now, that's cynical, right? And I admit it, but we've got huge developments too. So for instance, a more sophisticated um, stab was made at um, better building standards for housing with the active house. Now, they, in Denmark, uh, they introduced issues of thermal storage in the building, natural ventilation, adaptive envelopes, solar system. It was much more sophisticated. And um, unfortunately, it was, it was sponsored by Velux. So you get an awful lot of sort of roof lights. So this, the overheating problem sometimes still exists. What happens now? We're in the teens. Suddenly, the mantra is changing again. We're needing radical new approaches. If you think this is 2003, 72,000 people died across Europe in that one heat wave event in 2003. They died in buildings, usually, and often in their own homes through heat stress. By 2050, that'll be every second summer. By 2080, that'll be a cool summer. So shouldn't we be designing buildings differently? And this is uh, Grand Designs Passive House on the west coast of Scotland. And three weeks, I'm, do, I'm doing, I'm working with this as a case study. Three weeks after it's built, um, the roof comes off, crushes the car, and the person who built it said the actual building in the high wind ripples. We were supposed to do a, a site visit last week the current owner, who they rebuilt the route very strongly, but he was so frightened in it that we, we couldn't go over and see him last Friday. Brittle buildings, brittle energy systems. And this phenomenon, which is sort of hidden, but we're all part of, which is the disappearing middle classes. So our income year on year is buying us less. And so as energy prices begin to, well, they've soared three, four times since... 2000, it begins to hurt. So how do we think differently about buildings? Um, I want you to try and think about the idea of well-behaved buildings. Now, many of you will know my Oxford Eco House because that's the first house with a solar roof in Britain. But it was also, I designed it after 10 years in the Middle East in hot deserts to not overheat. And what I think the future is going to be about is seeing buildings more and more as climate refuges, as climate ready and future proof, as obviously run on solar energy but with storage and lots of adaptive opportunities and behaviours being seen as part of the solution, not the problem. So what's the innovations going to be? It's a mixed technology revolution. Next generation thinking is not about the machine build being the solution, but people being also part of the solution. Um, buildings seen as complex entities and designing with climate. And right at the heart of this is a comfort revolution in how we understand how to design comfortable buildings. There is no one comfort temperature. And this is where we say people live in comfort clouds. People adapt themselves to the temperatures they occupy, and if they're not comfortable, they change themselves or their buildings. And three degrees centigrade design is basically designing with adaptive comfort in mind. Um, in the old days, the people, the machine domin dominated thinking wanted you to have one temperature all year, whereas the reality of future climate amelioration is going to be that temperatures indoors track temperatures outdoors in the future simply by for instance allowing your internal temperatures to cycle on choice between say 18 and 28 as they do in the Dutch regulations you can save 50% of all your heating and cooling energy in it anyway but this is the reality of how we live in our homes this is people in Britain. Each one of those is indoor living room temperatures in a UK house from UCL study um, across um, in 2007, 2008. And there are a lot of people who are living in temperatures in their living rooms, 10 to 15 degrees centigrade. Um, some people living up 
up here in 25. Ah, this is August um, to January, so it'll depend on whether it's summer or winter. I don't know if any of you live in very cold temperatures, but I certainly do in my um, Learmonth Terrace house. So this is the English comfort cloud. This is people in different houses living in different temperatures. They learn to live in those temperatures. Behind that, you can see the temperatures occupied in Japan in winter and in Japan in summer. And here is the Gulf, where I'm going in a, a, a couple of months' time. Uh, one of my PhDs is studying. In houses in Dammam, people live between 20 to 35 degrees centigrade. This is their ordinary living room temperatures. Um, and the same, this is the Japanese as well in summer. They live between 20 to 25 degrees centigrade. But you'll notice also in Japan that you see the... the um, khaki color behind. A lot of Japanese live in much colder temperatures than they have. They have houses with paper walls often. Yeah? So how do they do it? They do it as they've done for millennia. They, they live with a kotatsu. Yeah? They have a traditionally a, a small fire in the floor and then they have a table over it and so on. They use this in Spain. Some of you might have seen that there. They use it through the Middle East, the Corsi. Um, they just have a different way of living, a different lifestyle. And in Japan, now, you can't turn on the air conditioning in a government building if it's less than 28 degrees centigrade. So um, people have had to change their clothing. We've got cool biz, super cool biz. If you want a nice, a good laugh, just Google super cool biz, and you'll see an um, amazing range of technologies. And here's another approach, personal environmental technologies, where instead of heating or cooling that whole space, you keep it at a basic temperature and heat or cool the person who needs the heating or cooling. Personal environmental technologies, you take them around with you. This is the queen, she can't afford to heat Buckingham Palace. She sits in front of a two bar fire. Um, and so you're, you take your little pet with you if you're, you're sort of going around the house. But this is something I'm working with in, in New Zealand, um, climate refuges. In New Zealand, they have a rapidly aging population, they have rubbish buildings, and they have very more extreme weather. So rather than trying to make a whole house energy efficient, you buy your gran a cool corner, a cozy corner for Christmas, one room with the double glazing and no drafts and, and nice um, carpets. Or else in summer, I've also done this, this report recently in Adelaide where a lot of people have died in their homes in heat waves. You just buy gran a cool corner for for Christmas down there too. So you're just creating climate refuges with adaptive opportunities. And um, this is taken to extremes in places like Singapore where they're cooling the whole island down. They're cooling the city. So they're using planting. And where they've got hot spots, they're trying to introduce planting to reduce temperatures. And it's the same everywhere. You Increasingly, cities will have cool refuges. This is Nice. Melbourne, etc., and countries with refuges, climate refuges. This is January um, in Washington, um, where they're just moving people into refuges. So think of climate as a real challenge. But innovation too. So one is is um, a different approach to technology. But this is where architecture matters. Number two is better basic buildings. Remember those vernacular buildings that we used to live in around the world? Complex buildings often with multiple microclimates right around them. Well, this is where the revolution has to happen because if you get a good basic building that's not going to overheat, you get what I call a well-behaved building. You have a basic pulse in the building. That's to do with the form of it, its orientation, the size of its windows, um, whether it's facing west or south or east or north, um, and the materials it's made of, how much storage you've got in. So you can get really well-behaved buildings. And say we take a level one good building, so-so, the passive house, that tends to overheat. And I mean, people do build buildings like that. You can see them in Edinburgh. I mean, why in the world would you? Just imagine when the, the lights go out on that one. They have a sort of amplitude. So if you have a well-behaved building, you might not need much more energy, 
For a so-so building, you'll need extra energy. And for a badly behaved building, you'll need a lot more energy. So it's the fundamental building that you need. Um, and that's a level one decision. That's the building. Everything you can't change. Everything you can change is the machines, the U values, the shading, the insulation. You can change the heating, the cooling systems over time. That's a second level adaptation, right? Um, the trouble is that too many HVAC engineers, the solution is just that. So you take a so-so building and you run it on local, en uh, local energy for heating in winter and natural ventilation for cooling and something. You just need a fraction of the energy. But HVAC engineers typically are taught how to do that, not this. So, I mean, therein lies a problem, this siloization. And in the future, I mean, I don't know if you know Ole Fanga, but his Bjorn Olesen, who's his, his protege, said, the future of buildings is that for most of the year, they will be naturally ventilated. The shoulder seasons, you might need pets. And in deep winter and deep summer, you'll need air conditioning increasingly. Yeah? But run a building for as long as possible on natural ventilation. Now, level three is the, that top level, which is very different. It's how you perceive a building. It's all the things about the mind. And I've got the scale from wow to well-being. Um, and I maintain that too much architecture is in this sphere. So you've got architects who are largely trained with much more visual things. And engineers who, I mean, wonderful engineers and architects working together here on this building, many of us will love light, ventilation, things. But a lot of the design decisions here are made by the engineers. So one of the problems here is, is um, this siloization. Um, innovation three, of course, is powering our buildings. We have to power them on solar energy. That's how we get the zero, near zero carbon buildings. Um, and today, actually, heat's what we need. Well, heat, we can... Heat is very cheap energy. You can get it with sensible um, storage and incoming um, solar radiation and so on. And how, where does the Scottish power come from? 50% of all our electricity now comes from renewable energy. So we're getting there. Scotland is, is actually leading the world. And this was July last year. Uh, these are all the great solar pioneers. There's Crispin Tekel, George Gougemith of AES Solar. Bruce Cross, and there are a million solar homes. There are only two, 25 million homes in Britain today, and one million have got solar roofs now. There are now, that was July, there's now nine gigawatts of installed solar energy in Britain. There's only 9.2 of nuclear. But nobody ever tells you that, does it? Do they? Um, and load shifting and load shaving is quite, this is the next generation putting... Um, this is, I'm just having that fitted, the SMA um, solar battery in there so you can run even more on the energy you generate off your roof. And what we're working on now is small microgrids for communities where what you're doing is you're orchestrating, you're taking all the renewable energy you can generate and actually um, running your community on storage and renewable energies. So that's really exciting. This is from MIT, yeah, electric cars, electric bikes, and this is what they should have done in Arizona, the electric light rail station. They could have run it on one of their power towers, 500 and, 590 megawatts of power from that solar power tower, 24 hours a day. And of course, right across the world, we've got uh, Nido in Japan, we've got Freiburg, you know, a world in which we can run our life on clean, renewable energy. And this is um, Dezhou in China, where they have Solar Valley, where they've got um, solar factories for creating solar, solar um, cells and solar systems. So what sort of future do we want? Machines are vulnerable, run by few, um, difficult to change. This is a real picture. They were told to back down the hatches and go through the cyclone because they couldn't afford the energy to go around. Jobs for a few very vulnerable, you know, even to a couple of Somali pilots. 
This gets you from A to B. It's jobs for many. It's self-repairing systems. It's running solely on free, clean, renewable energy. So why do we innovate? We innovate for a different future, a resilient future. We don't want systems that bounce back to systems that have failed. We want systems that bounce forward, that keep us and our children safe forever. So the two things I want to leave you with, what are the innovations? It's not about gizmos or widgets or more of this or less of this. The revolution that has to happen is a new age of design, and I think it's the coming together of architects and engineers working shoulder to shoulder um, and creating a new generation of buildings, not limited by the incredible limitations of the ordinary design CAD system, which doesn't tell you about natural ventilation or thermal mass or getting the orientation right. Innovation number one is the innovation that has to happen in the mind. That's where the revolution occurs. Taking back the power because architecture, getting that fundamental building right, is incredibly important to our future and the safety of our children. Innovation number two is being in the right place at the right time. And where better to innovate for a better world than in the innovation nation Scotland where we had the Enlightenment in 1790 and 1775. We built the Industrial Revolution. We built the empire with our engineering like my dad did. And we can build a better future in Scotland with better architecture, at which point I'll hand over. Well, good evening, everyone, and I'm delighted that uh, so many of you have turned out here uh, to hear about the Festival of Architecture in such a, a, an absolutely foul night. Um, so what is the Festival of Architecture about? Um, well, we were having a bit of a joke in the office today um, as we were trying to think up puns and sayings and we came to the conclusion that the Festival of Architecture 2016 is the festival that reaches the parts other festivals don't reach. And I think uh, we're going to be able to show you how we've managed to do some very innovative things in getting that, that message across. Um, the Festival of Architecture is unique in the sense that it is the first Scotland is the first country anywhere in the world to have a year-long nationwide festival of architecture. That's what setting is about. And our intention is not to be the profession talking to ourselves, but to, reaching out, to reach out to the widest possible audience. Um, we want to celebrate Scottish architecture above all things. We are doing it on, a, 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 I think, an incredible scale. We've got over 500 artists and creators and architects <coughs> involved. Um, many millions of online visitors uh, we think we will be reaching out to. Um, we've been, Cherie, uh, uh, who's here tonight with me, um, we've been working on building up all of our estimates for who's going to be coming and what the reach is going to be. And we're looking over 500,000 visitors and participants. Uh, we've got an incredible range of national press and media partners, including the Herald and Times group, um, Edinburgh's own Scotsman, um, the Skinny, the List, and even the Daily Mail have been approaching us, and of course uh, our broadcasters, BBC and STV. I have to say, when I first took on this role, I thought this is going to be a really hard sell. Absolutely not. Nothing could be further than the truth. And we are developing um, an incredible partnership to, de uh, to deliver this festival. Um, <coughs> just to let you see, the festival is being led by the 
RIS, the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland, but we are firmly part of the Year of Innovation, Architecture and Design, and uh, the public funding that comes along with that is being uh, very firmly managed within, within this, this context. You can see here through this presentation, and I hope you'll begin to recognise these lozenges and this shape. We've got um, some re what we think is really clever, cool-looking graphics, um, very bold and very uh, obvious. Um, but what makes us different is the spread of the activity throughout the year with over 32 uh, with all 32 local authorities involved, and we are looking at hundreds of events taking place across across Scotland. This map has grown incredibly just since we first did this slide, uh, not so terribly long ago. Um, it's only possible because of the range of partners that we have now over a, a hundred, and I think you'll recognise some of Scotland's leading organisations within this um, within this list so what you can see here are the spread the breadth and the depth of of the festival so we've got the six uh, RIS cha chapters who are all taking months to concentrate their activity. Uh, we've got our seven partner hubs who are taking uh, different uh, times. And uh, we also have the five university schools of architecture who are all planning events. And uh, of course, we've got um, a range of community activity that is happening through, throughout, throughout the year. But what's it actually going to consist of? Well, we've got a, at its core um, headline events that we are directly producing and managing. And the very first of these, and this is a real hot ticket, so um, we're getting very close to selling out on that. So if you want to be part of it, and I think this is certainly going to be one of the big cultural events of 2016, is Hinterland, which is a, a, a kind of incredible um, light and sound reanimation of the St Peter Seminary out at Cardross. So taking this incredible brutalist structure and transforming it. And we think it's going to set the tone for the whole festival, showing uh, how we intend to transform people's perception of, of architecture. Um, so d don't miss your opportunity to, to uh, get the, the last re remaining tickets uh, for, for that. Um, then in Edinburgh, we're going to have a pop-up World Cities Expo, uh, where we have invited 14 of the world's leading cities. You may say, why 14? It's, uh, there's only room for 14 pavilions uh, on Mound Square, just outside the National Gallery. Um, and we have three Scottish cities, including um, Glasgow, Edinburgh, of course, as the host city and Dundee, and we're absolutely delighted, but please don't leak it. Uh, Kengo Kuma will be designing the uh, the Dundee pavilion for, for this. So I, I may be indiscreet and drop lots of things tonight, so please don't tell anyone. Um, and I'm sure there's nobody from the press that will uh, will spread any any of, of this very secret information. Um, this will be for two weeks at the end of June and two weeks at the beginning of, of July, leading up to the festival. So uh, around this as well, there'll be a whole series of events and seminars. So uh, look forward to a really fantastic uh, opportunity in, in Edinburgh. 
Um, we then lowered the tone just a wee bit, but with a very serious purpose behind what is quite a fun um, event. And this is, again, a touring exhibition, the Ideal Hut Show, where we take um, bog-standard garden sheds, um, you know, the B&Q garden shed, and we pimp them up. Um, and these will be uh, transformed by leading architects and designers. Uh, we're launching it at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh, then touring to Glasgow, Dundee, Inverness and Perth. So great fun and a whole load of animation and activity and programmes that will be taking place around that. Slightly more seriously, uh, but hopefully very well presented and beautifully curated uh, by the National Portrait Gallery, um, out of their heads, and it's exploring the minds, the inner thinking of uh, Scotland's greatest ever architect. This is uh, Rowan Anderson, who was the uh, first ever president of the Royal Incorporation of Architects of, of Scotland, uh, but some of Scotland's greatest architects will be represented in this. Um, a bit more fun, a bit lighter, and very much aimed at um, a, a, a different type of audience is Adventures in Space. Um, and that will be taking place in the Lighthouse. Um, so we'll be doing all-night clubbing events around this um, in, in the middle of summer and uh, also a lot of activities for, for children and young people. Um, again, using something that's quite fun, quite cool, but to get across the serious point of um, the, the, the difference, uh, different types of, of uh, built environments can make, how, how it can influence societies, um, you know, di dystopia and film or utopia and uh, the impact architecture um, as presented through science fiction uh, can make. Um, Scott style, this is one for everyone, um, and it's the hundred top buildings of the last hundred years to coincide with the RIS centenary. Um, I hope some of you have already been involved because the long list was generated by public nomination um, and we've had an expert panel working on it and they've whittled it down to the, the top 100 buildings. Um, this will then be a series of uh, touring exhibitions that truly will be going the length and breadth of Scotland from Shetland to uh, Dumfries and Galloway and the borders and everywhere in, in between. So we're even taking it out uh, using our partners, uh, Caledonian McBrain and Scottrail, um, making sure this is going across um, the length and breadth of, of Scotland and out some of the, out some of the islands. Um, this is the one I'm really looking forward to, and this is going to bring out the child in all of us. Um, and this is this is happening right now at the the National Museum of Scotland. Um, build it with with Lego bricks. So again, there'll be a whole series of events and activities like this using Lego, using Minecraft, and this will be the foundation of a massive community engagement program that will again be happening. This is only a, a kind of whiz through and a taster of of what's what's happening. Um, um, this one, very significant in the sense that this is the first exhibition, annual exhibition of the Royal Scottish Academy uh, devoted to architecture, at least since 1907. So um, I think this is a recognition of just how important um, the, this year is going to be. Um, we've got everyone involved. Obviously, Maggie's centres have become... Um, not only icons of um, medical care and uh, the, the very best in standards uh, for looking after patients with, with cancer, 
but they are in themselves architectural icons and the impact they have had on the health and well-being of, of this country and the innovation that has been introduced through, through those developments, I think, is going to be uh, very clear. So several exhibitions, but also culture crawls um, and uh, a whole series of adventures that will be led by, by Maggie's. Um, everybody's going to get involved in this and music will play a big part in it. So um, we've got uh, a, a competition for young composers where we will be working with the Royal Scottish National Orchestra and leading Scottish composers and working with schools and young people across Scotland. We've selected half a dozen of Scotland's leading contemporary buildings and uh, again from, from Orkney to, to Edinburgh. Um, and these young people will select one of these buildings and compose a serious piece of music um, inspired by, by, by these buildings. Um, and we will then be celebrating those um, in performances. Um, Doors Open Day happens every year. You've probably all, you probably think you have, you have all seen it, but you won't ever have seen anything again on this kind of scale. So working with the Scottish Civic Trust, we will be having Doors Open Day events in, again, every one of Scotland's 32 local authorities. So it's going to be a, a massive, a massive programme. This is my particular favourite, and it's nothing to do with the fact that it's made out of cake. Um, this will, in fact, be a culmination of our community engagement, our work with children and young people. We're working with the BBC, with Education Scotland, Architecture and Design Scotland. We will be taking our architects into schools. We will be talking to these children and young people. What is it an architect does? How do they work? How, what does a brief mean? How is that delivered? We will be getting them to do some of this work online. Uh, they'll be producing their, their own uh, 3D models of buildings and uh, these buildings will then be recreated in cake and all taken to uh, Stirling Castle on the 11th of September, where we will build an enormous map of Scotland in cake. So that's when you absolutely, even if you have no skills yourself, I have neither baking nor architectural design skills, but I'll be there to eat the cake if nothing else. Um, all of this is going to be filmed captured this entire programme of events, this activity. Uh, somehow we are going to manage to digitise it, capture it in film, um, books, exhibitions, and we are bringing it all together in a massive finale event in Dundee, uh, in what we are beginning to talk about as the amphitheatre of the Tay. So if you think about what's happening in Dundee at the minute, the whole redevelopment of the waterfront, uh, the, the rail bridge, the new um, stationed redesign, the care hall is the backdrop, and that wonderful new waterfront, we're going to be having a massive party there um, at the end of it. The that will again be this culmination of everything that has has taken place. Um, I've put this one in because I'm from Glasgow and the Glasgow Institute of Architects have of course lowered the tone so I thought it would give you an opportunity in Edinburgh to laugh at them. It's not that they're inviting Barack Obama to come to the festival but they have in fact uh, developed uh, the Architects Ale which is a series of um, beers basically um, that are going to be really really beautifully packaged and be an educational experience in themselves so you really need to look out for that and it will be on sale at many of the uh, festival events 
Um, that's a kind of whistle stop tour through um, through uh, what what we're doing. But I hope that what it has been able to do is give you a sense of what's unique about about this festival. This really will be a, a national celebration of great architecture, and we're hoping it will transform Scotland's relationship with its built environment and improve our appreciation and understanding and really help to change perceptions and involvement uh, in, in Scotland's architecture. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much uh, to both Karen and Sue for two really fascinating uh, discussions. And um, Sue and Karen have, have um, agreed to take some questions over the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, and could I just ask that if you, uh, before you ask any questions, if you could wait for the mic, uh, please, that'd be grand. So who would like to ask a question? It's a gentleman at the back there. Good evening, and thank you very much, ladies, for what I thought was a really, really interesting and entertaining talk. Um, I have a question for Sue, first of all, if you don't mind. Um, I noticed that in all the factors that you mentioned about uh, the, the things that we're going to have to consider when we're designing buildings for the future, unless I missed it, there was one that, that struck me as it should have been in there, but it wasn't, and that was the, the question of minimum space standards, because those are going to, but what we want in a house is also going to depend on not just which way it faces or how easy it is to heat, but the minimum amount of space that a building will contain. We seem to be very, very reluctant in Scotland to set down minimum space standards. Do you want to comment on that? I, th I think that we live in an age in which building markets are very much driven by um, you know, the vested interests of what suits the developer. Um, I think that um, probably a lot of you might have um, different views on this, but I, I would agree with you that I think a society you can judge, this is why we're so good in Scotland usually, you know, that we, you can judge a society by the well-being of the ordinary people in it. And we look at a world now in which, I don't know about your children, but, but my children, I can't see how they'll afford, you know, their own houses and, and so on, working in London and things like that. So basically, if you could rewrite the DNA of how the world works to ensure that each family is respected, each family is taken out of your poverty. That's one reason I, I do do a lot of work on solar energy. The only way to take a family out of your poverty is to give them the means of generation on their own roofs. Um, that they have a decent space to live in and a decent opportunity for life. I would agree that, that people underestimate the power of each individual unit in the health of the whole. So I would agree with you. If, if um, I'm not an expert at all on, on this or uh, qualified in any way to talk about standards, what I would say is that it is very much our intention um, to try and engage with the wider public much more to help give them the vocabulary that they can start to engage uh, much more with um, public consultations, feed in their, their own ideas and make sure they have a better understanding. That's why we are doing things like Lego events and Minecraft events with, with, with school children um, so that you know they, they are beginning to develop that understanding of just how important architecture can be and the um, impact for good or ill of good architecture or bad architecture. Thank you, ladies. We have a, a question here. Question primarily for Sue Wolf. Uh, your talks, both of you, were excellent. Thank you. Um, should architects and engineers get better at retrofitting, or is the new too exciting? Mm -hmm. From the point of view of energy efficiency, consumption, I do understand the need to create buildings more intelligently to fit the parameters you're describing. But the elephant in the room, in a sense, is the building stock that exists, which isn't going to uh, fall down overnight. Um, it's quite interesting that in your insurance, 
If you occupy a house that's built after 1971, your insurance premium is higher because buildings built after 1971 have a tendency to fail more frequently. Um, so there's, there's an awful lot of solid buildings out there, aren't there? Um, I think that retrofitting is, is um, going to be absolutely essential. How, much, how many more new buildings and homes can we afford to build? I mean, it's quite interesting, the housing market, you're dealing with it now, and we've had, I think it was 2008, in July 2008, not one single house, was it 2009, was finished in Scotland. Now we have a relative housing boom, but it's all the same type of housing, too. But, I mean, the, the bulk, the backbone of our stock is, is um, what, pre-1971 anyway. So I think absolutely yes. And I think that we're going to have to... But we're held back, again, by the, this um, terrible sort of limit on our thought that, for instance, planners um, say you can't have... Uh, new double glazed buildings in a, in a house because it looks slightly different from what it was. They're trying to recreate a world of the 1950s, whereas we're going to have to design for a world of the you know, 2050s. So I, I think that we're going to have to revolutionize planning again to make sure that we're designing, redesigning a world using what we've got that's fit for purpose in 2050. So I think so, yes, but I mean, it's going to take a revolution in planning. It's going to take a revolution in how we engineer our buildings to maybe invest in them. Did you like that idea of mine of, of starting with one small room in, in houses and maybe not trying to suddenly refurbish all the housing stock, stock of Scotland? But in, in New Zealand, if an old lady or an old man falls in their home and goes to hospital with pneumonia, they're then sent with a health worker back to their house afterwards to make sure they've got the right pills. Why don't they take everybody who's 80 plus and go into their homes and say, are you safe thermally in your home? Let's renovate this one little room and then we'll think about the rest of the house to make sure that they never end up in hospital again. So I think this, you're right that what you have to do is you have to think ahead and develop strategies that can gradually build resilience across the board, and retrofitting homes has to be part of building that resilience. Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, we've got a question from the gentleman in the middle there. Uh, John, please. Hi, thank you. The, the question is really for, for Sue in particular in the first presentation, which I thought was very good. Thank you for that. Um, you we're talking about use of solar panels uh, on potentially every every house. Um, I wonder if you had a view on the concept of the Scandinavian district heating and cooling network and the use of decentralised energy in networks rather than individual solutions in every household. Uh, do you have a view on that? I do have a view on it. Um, if you if you go to um, one of the housing developers out in the borders or up in the, the, you know, in the rest of Scotland, they'll have a, a plot of 250 homes. And they'll say, right, we'll put central heating in there. But actually, we can't build all 250 to begin with. We've got to build 50 to start with, and then we'll do the next. Who pays for it? I mean, basically, who's going to put in the infrastructure? Glasgow, they're doing a lot. But there are limitations, because you've got this huge infrastructure costs. And that's my, my concern, is that it's actually very expensive to do and, and very intrusive. But the second thing is that if you do up the houses so they don't need very much, then, again, who's going to pay for it? It's like building nuclear power stations, uh, you know, that are supposed to... Um, well, anyway, who, who's going to, to pay for the build costs if you don't need much energy? Um, the second thing is this fuel poverty thing. They still have to buy the energy in. If, for instance, like Hinkley C is supposed to provide um, power enough for six million homes, for the same cost of building that, on six million homes in Britain, which is a quarter of the homes um, in Britain, you could put solar hot water with a storage tank, you could put photovoltaics with a battery, and you would take six million or a quarter of the homes of Britain 
out of fuel poverty forever and because they don't have to buy the energy in afterwards. Um, I don't know where we're going in the future with this flatlined economy where less and less people are in work, but you have to make sure that the kids are warm enough to be able to do their homework so they can afford to pay for the food and they can afford to pay for the mortgage because that's went wrong. what went wrong in Arizona when I was working there in 2007. By the time they'd paid for the health care and the credit cards and the car, they couldn't pay the mortgage. So you have to really make everyone safe in their own home. So I see the solar solution as, as the best one. For in Dundee, we did a study. We could take all of the homes in central Dundee, all the, the housing council houses, two and a half thousand of them, put solar on them, um, solar hot water, for I think it was 67 million, which was a quarter of the price and take the, all the council houses out of fuel poverty in Dundee, quarter of the price of the ring, new ring road for Aberdeen. So the money's out there, but people don't want to spend it on you know, ordinary homes and ordinary people. Like the tram here, 17, 792 million. That's 35,000 pounds for every council house in Edinburgh. Interesting. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've got time for one more question. And the lady sat at the back there, Jill, please. Okay. Hi there. Um, thank you both for a wonderful it was educational talk. Um, I'm afraid it's directed to Sue again. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned the fragmentation between the engineers and architects and I completely agree with you. I do believe that even filters through to every stage in a, in a construction project. Um, and obviously this building information modelling is taking a bit of a, a front, uh, is taking front stage at the minute um, and you've got the collaborative uh, benefits that are said to be associated with that. Um, and BIM has almost taken over from innovative sustainable thinking, which is, you know, whether it's correct or incorrect at this stage is, is to be debated. Um, do you believe that BIM can aid into the sustainable design process and bring together the architects and engineers? I personally think that putting, spending your entire life chasing the, whether you put a line from A to B and how the model does it, means that you don't think. I think it's de-skilling people. I cannot understand why it's being forced down people's throats. Um, I don't know if you agree with me. You probably find it revolutionary. There's obviously <coughs> reasons why one wants replicability in floor plans and so on. But um, it doesn't do things like thermal mass in buildings. It doesn't do natural ventilations, which are the air engines which run natural systems. It doesn't do sort of solar gain any, but it also turns architects into cat monkeys. Mm. You know, where, where's the, the, the genius? You know, you don't do the curves or the rounds or the, maybe I'm wrong, but it's basically making architects a slave to something that's not doing what you want it to do in the end. Um, I would say we, we try at Harriet Watt, we run the, the architectural uh, engineering course there. You know, that in first year, everybody, T learns to sketch and, and to look and to, to learn from just that thing of putting a pencil on a piece of paper, drawing a line and feeling it, and then you're thinking with it. In a machine, you know, the machine's doing the thinking for you, you become almost a slave to the machine. And maybe I'm just very Luddite on this. I'd love to hear your opinions on this. Okay, thank you, Sue. And. Um... <clears throat> You maybe hear there's some opinions outside just in a minute. Okay. Um, but um, ladies and gentlemen, if I could just ask you to uh, show your appreciation to Sue and Karen for two fantastic uh, talks this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.